Okay, so thanks everybody. Um, my name's Michael Mackin, as we've just heard. Let me connect myself to this in the pocket. Um, and I'm talking to you about web accessibility. Now, this is uh, actually a massive topic to try and cover in 15 minutes or possibly less. Um, so I'm just going to give you uh, a little bit of overview about the theory and then hopefully some practical stuff that you can actually use. Uh, to ensure your web content accessible. How many people here actually make content that ends up on a website somewhere? Okay, good. And how many people here know what an alt tag is? Oh, fantastic, okay. All right, so maybe this is all gonna be just really boring for you because I kinda aimed it at a fairly basic level. So, um, but there is, to go into like a lot of heavy duty detail about this is just, like an endless rabbit hole. You, it's best to get on the web, Google WCAG, find out what applies to your particular type of content and the things you need to be aware of. Just quickly, like why accessibility is important. Um, you know, the, a, re, a Microsoft study found like 9% of web users have like a severe visual impairment, 2% of web users, which I mean, we're all web users, 2% of people have like a severe uh, audio impairment uh, hearing impairment, and just at UWS, if you translate that into uh, student numbers with, say, 40,000 students, 9% of 40,000 students is 3,600, according to my calculator, and 2% is 800 students. So there's just here in on campus, this uh, is an issue that affects a lot of people. We have to make sure our uh, content uh, is accessible to these people and we're not discriminating against them. Um, not just because we want to be nice, but it's increasingly becoming required by law. You can get sued in the States. It's a huge thing over there. Um, and there's a program underway here called the, um, you can read through that, uh, Government um, what's it called? Transition, National Transition Strategy, which the next slide talks about. But uh, it's also, that last point is worth just mentioning. It's important for good web practice search engine optimization. Uh, that may not be so relevant for views content, but still, if you're building web content, it's a really good thing to get your head around. And it takes a while to get your head around, trust me. There's currently a uh, program underway with the government to get all uh, Australian government websites up to AA WCAG 2.0 standard by the end of this year. Um, and there's a translation there. It's the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, version 2.0, for those who are new to the phrase WCAG. I'm not sure if that's anyone here, but um, uh, although the last report was that only about 20% of government websites were actually compliant, so it um, be interesting to see how close we get by the end of this year. But it's something we've been working on here for about three or four years now, um, we're still finding it challenging to get the resourcing required to do it on our corporate website, but we've been doing what we can and we're continuing to push hard to um, make the main website compliant. Uh, so it's also important that any student-focused content is also compliant. So we're going to hoon through WCAG 2.0 very quickly. Again, it's a huge topic, but there's basically four principles about what the web content needs to be. Perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust by anyone who's trying to access it, regardless of their abilities. Okay, so perceivable. This, this uh, requirement talks about, and this is all on the web and go, goes into huge detail, but we're talking about text alternatives for non-text -te content. So that's like alt tags, text alternatives for your um, images, captions for multimedia. If you've got like forms that people need to fill out, actual text <coughs> labels describing the fields on those forms are important. Um, summaries of tables, things that are not actually in text, things that a screen reader can't read need to have some form of text there that a screen reader can read for people who you know, are visually impaired and using a screen reader. Um, making it easier for users to see and hear content. That gets right down to things like text color and contrast. What is the background color too similar to the text color? That sort of thing. The second principle, the content has to be operable. You need to be able to tab through uh, fields in a form in the correct order. That's an example of having functionality available from a keyboard. 
giving users enough time to read the content. That's uh, the classic one of that is your slider on, well, like on our home page, which I think we're probably not complying with, but there should be a pause button there for people who need a little extra time to read the content. Um, <coughs> do not use content that causes seizures. They spelled that one out very clearly for us. And uh, helping users navigate to find content. <coughs> that point actually is referencing such things like meaningful text on a link. So instead of having like something like click here as the linked text, you know, to download something, you would instead have the phrase download this important document as the link text. You heard that one before? That's important? Yep. Good. We'll go through the examples in a sec. Um, oh, hang on. So it's got to be understandable, principle three. So um, this, this actually like delves into such detail like, you know, just use simple language. Make the text appropriate for your audience in as simple and clearly a way as you can. Um, make it operate in predictable ways. Second item up there. If your link is going to open in a new window, you have to warn people. If, like sometimes web content authors might think, well, I'll, I'll make all these links open in a new window because then theoretically they're not leaving my page. I, you know, my Google Analytics will show that they've stayed on my page for a longer time. But every time you open a link in a new window, you break the back button. And unless there's a warning that this is going to happen, it's confusing for people uh, who, especially if they're using assistive devices and don't get a visual trigger that this window, this particular link has triggered a new window. Helping users avoid and correct mistakes is the third point there. That refers to such things like forms. If, it, if your form triggers an error, the error message needs to be accessible as well. It needs to be in text. It needs to be readable. Ideally, it needs to be right next to the place where the error occurred. And the fourth principle of WCAG 2.0, maximize compatibility with current and future tools. It's basically uh, covering things like make sure your HTML is compliant and don't embed things like Flash or Silverlight plugins that may not work in six months or 12 months time as the plugin technology changes. All right, so racing through some really simple practical examples that many of you might be across, alt text. If you're putting an image on a page and that image has some words in it, the alt text really, really has to have those words in it. Otherwise, someone using a screen reader is going to completely miss what that image was trying to convey. Uh, but another example of, a, say, an image without any text in it is fine to just have a description like that. So be aware of the different uh, uses of alt text. Text alignment. Uh, designers love this kind of fully justified look for text, but uh, it means the space between words is different on every line. It, it decreases the readability. Of course, center alignment is even worse because each line starts somewhere different. So please ensure all content is left justified. Heading structure is really important. Um, screen readers do use these H1, H2, H3 headings to help convey the importance of the content and helps the people using screen readers to navigate around the web page. Uh, it's also, this is also really important for SEO if you're building web pages that are aimed at the general public. Anything in an H tag uh, is noted by the Google robot and uh, will, show up, will help you, people find your page if they're putting in search terms. Um, there's a lot more detail about heading structure and these tools on the web. Uh, link text, as we mentioned earlier, don't link, just click here. Link the whole piece of information. Download the campus map here would have been okay too. Uh, so that's an example of keeping link text accessible. Oh yes, so, and documents. There's like a leaderboard for the most accessible way to present information. HTML is up the top number one. On the web, it's the most compatible with the most number of assistive devices. Uh, if for some reason you need to provide the information in a document, a Word document or rich text or simple text kind of document is also quite acceptable, especially if it's well structured with that heading structure. PDFs are a bit of a nightmare. You, Adobe claim they can create accessible PDFs now and some of them are not too bad. They're getting better all the time. 
but the end users often will, depending on the uh, latest version of their screen reading uh, tool, may still have problems with PDFs. So it, they're not considered accessible, and audit, accessibility, accessibility audits basically fail anywhere that has a PDF and no plain text alternative. So avoid them if you can. Um, and again, more information on the web about that. And I wanted to go through a bit, a bit more detail about video captioning, if I can. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, because this is a big thing, we're all being pushed into, you know, this, this great new online world and we're making videos and we're doing lots of cool stuff online and it's great. Students love it. But for the percentage of students who need to have their videos captioned, and that's a lot of students, uh, we have to do it right. Luckily, YouTube make it really, really easy. If you need to put a video onto views and you're using YouTube, you can actually get it captioned very easily, well, relatively easily, um, thanks to the Google auto-captioning thing, which I'm sure you've all seen and had a good laugh at. Uh, the auto-captions that Google generates, they're classic. I was doing one, this example is from one I was doing yesterday, and um, I wish I'd taken some screenshots of what it actually said the uh, VC was saying, because it called, um, anyway, it, it, was, it was quite funny, but I didn't put them on a slide, which is probably just as well. Um, so, yes, video captioning. Once you've uploaded your video, you can, if you're still logged in, you can go to the video page, click on the captions button, and on this editing page, you can see up the top, info and settings, enhancements, audio annotations, captions. This is where you can edit your video, and you can add, add captions, and you can edit the captions right there in the channel. So if you've got your own channel, or if you have access to a channel, you can go in, select the automatic caption track as using it just as a starting point. So you see all that hilarious stuff that Google generates that's mostly wrong, but enough of it's right that you can figure out where it is. You can actually play the video and literally type over it, make fix the corrections. If the audio is clear enough, it actually gets a lot of it right. Um, I did this, it was a two minutes 39 video. I did this yesterday. Uh, while I was making this, I had to upload it anyway, so I, I thought I'll make this presentation at the same time. It took me 10 minutes to fix the caption. So it's doable. It's not that hard. If you don't have time to do it yourself in there, you can do this. Under the little actions button in the video editor for captioning, you can download a file in .vtt format, which I don't actually know what that is, but when you download it, it comes out like this. It's just a very simple text file. There's not much going on in there. You can print that out and give it to someone else, like a student intern or anyone who owes you favours, and to say, OK, hey, I've got this text file. Can you watch this video? Give them the link to the video and just correct any words that you might find that are wrong. You don't have to mention that there'll be a lot of words wrong. And when they give it back to you, you can say, thanks, here's the bottle of wine, 1959 or whatever. And, um, and they'll be only, you know, too happy to have uh, made the exchange. So that's the other way to do it. Also, if you're a, uh, someone like a uh, blended learning uh, designer person or someone who has access to one of the corporate UWS video channels and you don't want to give everyone access to the channel, this is the way you can do it as well. You can upload the video and uh, generate the file, give it back to the client who asked you to upload it and said, no worries, I'll make this live as soon as you just uh, correct this text file for me. When they send it back, you upload it. Um, that's where you upload it, just un under the add a new track button, upload a file, and it'll replace the existing captions. So that's all I wanted to talk about, really. Uh, add all text to images, align text list justified, etc., etc., etc. Oh, and the other thing, avoid embedding flash elements. I forgot to put that in, so I typed it on the last slide. And any resources, you can always go to the Web Services Unit page, which is forward slash WSU. Uh, and please uh, investigate this further by Googling WCAG 2.0 or Web Accessibility Checklist. Thank you.